Good evening, dobry večer. Welcome to part three of Paths in Emancipation, a series of discussions organized by Contradictions, a journal for critical thought, and the Municipal Library of Prague. I'm Joe Grim Feinberg from the Philosophy Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, and in a moment we're going to speak with Siavesh Azeri from Tumen University about the situation today in Kurdistan. Before we turn to Siavesh, a few words on that situation itself. Kurdistan has gained international attention recently, not only because it's been the center of multiple conflicts, but also because of multiple new ideas about the meaning of democracy, of national liberation and internationalism that have been coming out of the region. And we're going to talk today about how these specific claims for Kurdish cultural and national liberation have been articulated within and against a system of international uh, governments, state governments, and a system of economic production that has historically excluded, repressed, and exploited Kurds. Now, every movement in its own way frames its particular claims with appeals to universal principles. But the Kurdish left, especially in Syria and Turkey, has been exceptionally successful recently in capturing international attention for its own struggle as it's presented its battles as battles for liberation that transcends these local communities and specific ethnicities. But this is not an easy task. The path from national liberation to internationalism is not clearly marked out. Each movement has to find its own way, it has to move along its own path. And so before we get into the details about how that's been done, uh, now I want to look back a little bit on the history of the Kurdish national movement, or rather multiple movements, and also briefly on the broader history of attempts to articulate nationalism and internationalism, claims for cultural defense and autonomy with claims for international solidarity. The Kurds are often referred to as the world's largest nation without a state. And there is some truth to this claim when in the 19th and 20th centuries, the world was divided up into nation states, none of the resulting states belonged to the Kurds. Although their numbers today are estimated at some 35 to 40 million people spread throughout the world in a diaspora, but especially in four countries, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. Uh, and so while some stateless nations are truly uh, very spread out throughout the world, Kurdistan exists as a contiguous location estimated perhaps around 450,000 square kilometers in which Kurds are the majority of the population. But this is not, as I said, in any single country. And because uh, it's spread out into different countries, the Kurdish national movement has also taken different paths in each location. But there's also an interesting way that the whole question is framed when we present the Kurdish people as the largest state, the largest nation without a state in the world. Because this idea already seems to presume that the outrage here is that there is a nation without its own state, rather than the fact that statehood has only been granted to nations, that nations have been told that they can only find liberation if they have their own states, and that states themselves have proven incapable of liberating more than one nation each. So implicit here is this idea that if only we could divide up the world more correctly and accurately and draw state borders around true ethnic borders, then everything would be all right. Imperialism and colonialism have created artificial borders 
And so the idea goes, what we need to do is find the real borders that reflect real communities. The trouble with this idea, as Kurdish activists themselves have come to realize, is that such real borders are extremely hard and probably impossible to find, especially in a world where people keep moving around. And in fact, every nation state draws its, the borders around its nation and nationhood in its own way. And so the reaction um, to, on the part of people who feel excluded from that national community is different in each case. So if we look at the way the Kurdish movement for cultural preservation, uh, autonomy, and also social emancipation has developed, we can we see four different stories in the four different countries of which uh, that make up most of Kurdistan. In Iran, in some ways, the situation has been less repressive as the successor to the Persian Empire. Uh, Iranian national identity maintains an element of the old imperial principle of ethnic diversity. And so even though the current regime in Iran is religiously and politically intolerant. It had it's found relatively more space than some other regimes in the region for nationalities that aren't specifically Iranian or Persian. Everyone can be Iranian in some way, in a way that's much more difficult in some of the other countries. So the Kurdish movement there has been, on the one hand, it's found difficult to express itself politically in this repressive regime, but culturally the repression has been, there's been less of a, uh, less pressure in Iranian Kurdistan to fight and take up uh, militant positions against the repression, cultural repression. I'm exaggerating a bit and perhaps we can complicate this issue as well when we talk to Siavesh later. Uh, who has actually spent time in both Iran and in Turkey. Uh, but now moving to Iraq and Syria. These two countries have a lot in common. Historically, uh, both were led until, in the case of Iraq, until recently, and Syria up till today, most of Syria, by Arab nationalist Ba'ath parties. And so while Iran has been ethnically tolerant and religiously intolerant, Iraq and Syria have been relatively tolerant of religious difference as they both have presented themselves as secular regimes primarily, but intolerant of non-Arab ethnicity. So while ethnic repression continued, uh, contributed to Kurdish national solidarity in these countries, Iraq and Syria, the weakness of the ruling regimes eventually uh, opened up space for Kurdish movements to even take de facto power in their regions. We'll get back to that in a minute. Now, in Turkey, the situation yet again is different. The Turkish state is more committed to secularism and to ethnic homogeneity than Iran, Iraq, or Syria. In effect, we could say that Turkey has tried to fulfill the European nation state model with exceptional fidelity, perhaps more faithfully than most European nation states. That is the model that emerged out of 19th century and 20th century national movements of one ethnic nation corresponding to one nation state. At the same time, Turkish national identity has been marked by how it grew out of earlier Ottoman identity under the Ottoman Empire national identity was very much tied up in religious affiliation uh, rather than language as in much of Eastern Europe and Central Europe. So while Turkey was founded in this process that led to mass expulsion and extermination of Christians, Muslim Kurds in Turkey were considered to be de facto Turks. So s Turkish secularism was trans it transformed this religious identity into an ethnic identity, and the result has been that it's, it's quite easy in Turkey to be a uh, non-religious Muslim. It's very difficult to be a non-Turkish Muslim. There's no clear place for Kurds who may have Muslim background 
but don't declare themselves to be Turks. And so while Turkey has been in some, at many moments more tolerant of political opposition than its neighbors to the southeast, it's been exceptionally intolerant of non-Turkish ethnic mobilization. This has led to a few uh, key developments. Well, actually, the developments in all of these four countries have contributed, have, have come together in complicated ways. Um, while the, the case in Iran is relatively self-contained, we can see how, uh, for example, in Turkey, the Kurdish, uh, Turkey expelled and forced uh, many of the members, leading members of the Workers' Party of Kurdistan that was founded in Turkey, forced them to leave the country, and they found refuge in Syria. The Syrian regime supported them as long as they were fighting against Turkey, up to a point, until it gave in to pressure and then stopped supporting them, at which point Turkey found its, uh, Syria found itself with a large group of well-trained militants that had been trained to fight against Turkey, but were now now became enemies of the Syrian regime in a very comp complex balance there. A second major development was that in the early 1990s, thanks to the weakening of the Iraqi regime, U.S. supported Kurdish, a Kurdish uh, uprising, won considerable autonomy in northern Iraq. And this in turn inspired many Kurdish groups across the border in Syria, leading the Syrian government to step up repression there. And so when the Arab Spring came and the Syrian civil war broke out and the central government lost control of much of the country, Kurdish groups in Syria, especially the radical leftist groups affiliated with the PKK, now affiliated there with the group called the PYD, these were very well positioned to fill this vacuum. Meanwhile, in Turkey, there were two significant developments. First, increasing repression by the government led to radicalization, but at the same time, there was a Kurdish-led leftist political party, the HDP, that became a major player in Turkish politics nationwide, not only in the Kurdish regions. Uh, and these, this party has uh, articulated demands that go far beyond Kurdish, specifically Kurdish ethno-cultural claims. This has also meant that in these different places, Kurdish movements have entered the state to a certain degree, be becoming a part of state politics or actually stake, taking de facto political power. And that has raised a lot of questions. For example, a question of whether to seek only partial autonomy or full independence or a nation state. Another question has been whether how to handle other ethnic groups that live within territory now controlled by Kurds. Kurds then in these territories no longer are just ethnic minorities relative to the larger state, but they're ethnic majorities relative to minorities that live in con territories controlled by them. So we'll return to both of these questions later in the discussion. Now, very briefly, before we turn to Siavesh, uh, a few words about how the traditions of left politics and Kurdish, Kurdish movements, of what they were drawing on when they tried to articulate their their own claims to national liberation and internationalism. Uh, as these, most of these parties and movements draw on the left tradition, they could look back to a lot of what had been articulated, but also, and we'll be interested in what might be new about what, they're, what they've expressed in recent years. Um, now, historically, it took the left quite some time to recognize that the national question was a serious question that deserved serious attention, to their credit, Men, much of the nationalist right still hasn't come to the realization that nationalism is actually a complicated issue rather than a simple one. Uh, but for most of the 19th century, leftists, leftist movements supported various independence movements, but generally they saw the distinction between the independence movements that were worth supporting, and then, on the one hand, movements of oppressed nations, and imperialism and national chauvinism of oppressor nations. This seemed to be a self-evident distinction. Only after time did it become clearer and clearer that 
many of the legitimate claims or apparently legitimate claims of different movements, including movements of various oppressed nations, could not be very easily reconciled. And there were a lot of different proposals put forth for how to reconcile these claims from people like Rosa Luxemburg focusing almost exclusively on class issues, saying we should simply leave national issues aside for the time being and focus on class. This is something that will unite us all. Two other attempts, like the Soviet attempts to grant territorial autonomy to different nations within a federation, a union of different republics and sub-republics, and uh, together this would create an international solution. On the other hand, we also can see historically it was a very uh, volatile solution that uh, led to the breakup of the Soviet Union in uh, the 1990s. That's one, one issue. Uh, there are also other, other trends that have not gained as much attention historically and that I think in some ways are more, more relevant to what much of the Kurdish movement is doing now. And those were attempts by leftist groups, for example, Austrian Marxists or the Jewish Yiddish speaking Bund that tried to articulate a notion of national cultural autonomy that wouldn't be tied to territory. It wouldn't demand independence of territory, but would recognize cultural multiplicity in each place at the same time as international solidarity among working people. Now, we'll jump forward and turn to the context that's both the intellectual context that has changed multiple times over the years, of course, passing through colonialism, decolonialism, uh, neoliberal imperialism, liberal multiculturalism, and we come now to the present moment in Kurdistan, and we'll turn to Siavesh Azeri to discuss this in, uh, in all of its complication. I'm now here with Siavesh Azeri, who's a professor of philosophy at the School for Advanced Studies at the University of Tumen in Russia. From 2013 to 2017, he was at the University of Mardin, in, located in Turkish Kurdistan, although in fact a very ethnically diverse area, from which he was fired in 2017 after signing a petition for calling for a peaceful uh, resolution to the conflict in Turkish Kurdistan. He's also, it's maybe worth mentioning, he is, was born in Iran and therefore also has some knowledge of other regions of, uh, that we'll be talking about and have been talking about. Um, but his, his specialty is in Marxist critique of epistemology and the philosophy of psychology and consciousness. He's also written on, on uh, political Islam and the political situation in Turkey and Iran. And so now uh, I'd like to turn to him uh, and also say a couple words about why I chose to speak with him. Um, I was interested especially in talking to you, Siavesh, uh, in part because although it, of course, is very important to talk to people on the ground, and I would love to also have here an activist from the HDP party in Turkey or the PKK or the PYD and, and uh, one of these important players in, in the region. Uh, it's also become very uh, polarized, the whole situation in, in uh, especially in Syria and Kurdistan. Understandably, in this uh, context of war, people have uh, feeling of the needs to really defend their own positions against uh, against attacks and and but I think there's also a place for some the the point of view of someone who's maybe not directly involved in one faction or another to take a complex view of the situation and so I know as you as someone who was 
was close to a lot of what was happening in Turkey, but not directly a party member. Um, that was one of the reasons that I, I valued your uh, point of view on these on these questions. And uh, so the first question I wanted to ask, as, as I mentioned, you're a Marxist philosopher, also a critique of of the of Turkish politics from a left perspective. And I wanted to ask about how, uh, how you look at the situation in Kurdistan from this perspective of, of leftism overall. Uh, we see on the one hand, there's I think a very interesting question about how, how the left has managed to be so successful in these national movements at a time when in much of the world national liberation movements have really been taken over by right-wing nationalism. And on the second hand, these movements that began as nationalist movements have uh, also maybe tried to, have tried to articulate some kind of internationalism at the same time. But starting with the first question, how has the left been so effective in positioning itself in, as the voice of national claims uh, in I guess you're, especially in Syria and, and in Turkey, where you've lived. Um, um, hello, uh, thank you for, uh, for, for giving me this opportunity, as a matter of fact, to talk about this important issue. Uh, well, I mean, we, we should look at the, uh, the historical, as a matter of fact, background. You know, like Kurdistan, like historically, right now, is, and geographically, it's been divided into four sections, I mean, four, four, four parts so to say i mean it, it's it's been divided between four countries iran turkey iraq and syria and in each of these countries like we we, we have been, we have faced you know like uh, it, the kurdish question has been uh, subject to different conditions political historical conditions so to the extent that that uh, the kurdistan in turkey or turkish kurdistan is is is, is concerned well, the reason that left, so to say, is strong there is because of the uh, historically strong leftist movement in Turkey. So in particular, you know, PKK uh, appeared on the scene, on the political scene as an active uh, political force uh, beginning 1984. Well, 1984, still it was, you know, like we were, were living in a bipolar world. Um, and, and, you know, like, uh, although there was the military coup, the, the military coup in 1980 happened, which you know kind of cleansed Turkey uh, of um, of leftists and leftism. Still, you know, like we had a very strong uh, socialist, communist, leftist movement in in Turkey overall. And uh, given, as I said, the situation, the political situation, international political situation, the bipolar in the bipolar world, okay, and uh, and the prestige. At, at that time, uh, for many different reasons, Marxism and, and socialism had any uh, liberation movement, whatever, you know, like no matter, you know, like uh, where they really politically would, 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 uh, would be positioned, will claim themselves to be, to be Marxists or socialists. So that's why at the beginning, PKK appeared as such a movement. Uh, so, but we see, for instance, a shift, as a matter of fact, in politics and ideology of PKK, as well as many leftist groups in Turkey, okay, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the, uh, end of the Cold War. And we see, like, of course, not only in Turkey, but in the whole region, that, you know, like, uh, nationalist movement, they came to the fore declaring themselves as nationalists, okay? Even PKK, as a matter of fact, you know, like, distanced them, uh, itself. From, from socialism, from Marxism, at, at least, you know, like, because at the beginning, in, back in 1984, according to his program, PKK was a Marxist-Leninist organization fighting for liberation of uh, Turkish Kurdistan uh, and the, with, with, with the claim of ending, you know, like the ethnic discrimination against Kurds, uh, you know, proposing a solution uh, based upon the, you know, like the allegedly Leninist, uh, um, principle of the rights of nation to self-determination, so on and so forth. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and particularly actually after the, Ocalan was kidnapped by Turkish security forces uh, with the help of CIA and, you know, like the 
some European intelligence services, uh, this shift, I mean, like became more visible, distancing from, you know, like uh, Marxism and socialism and adopting some sort of liberal, liberal anarchist, so to say, you know, like point of view. Uh, but still, you know, like the, 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 the fact that still left, uh, you know, like after a few years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, gained again momentum in Turkey and the class conflict, I would say, uh, became more intensified. We still see that, you know, like in, uh, some sort of revival of Marxist and socialist ideas and politics in Turkey. And uh, so because of these historical situations and the existing political situation, I think any movement that would uh, try to, you know, like some gain momentum in Turkey and in Kurdistan of Turkey have to, you know, like uh, has to adopt some sort of quote unquote left program, so to say. Now you mentioned Abdullah Ocalan, who is probably the best known figure of, Turk of Kurdish movements in any of the four countries of historical Kurdistan. Um, he's, uh, his, his writings have gained some popularity in, uh, in the West as well. Um, now, yeah, so it's true, he, he moved away from Marxist-Leninism, but at the same time has tried to articulate a different kind of leftist position for, for the PKK and the groups that are affiliated with it. And that's that, that itself has won a lot of support from Western anarchists and and uh, and libertarian socialists. Do you, is it possible to say how, to what extent this is uh, an authentically innovative aspect of his thought, and to what extent it may be a pragmatic decision that, on the one hand, the Soviet Union isn't around to offer support; on the other hand. Uh, Abandoning the demand for a uh, nation state and as is also a way of not provoking the Turkish state or the Syrian state as much. Um, also, we know, I mean, Ocalan himself is writing from prison, so he's not actually able to go on the ground and see what's what's happening. But uh, I don't know how how it's it's interesting to try to evaluate this kind of theory that's that's written also for very directly political purposes. Um, how do you see it as a, as a philosopher? Okay, uh, let, me, let me start from the very last, you know, like I mean <clears throat> that Turkey or, you know, like other regional forces would attack Kurds or Kurdistan, you know, like, so as a matter of fact, this is one of the alibis that the Kurdish nationalist movement is using in all four regions in order, you know, like to not to come with, up with the idea of, you know, like an independent Kurdistan. So if you go back, for instance, into 90s, 1990s, you know, like after the first uh, Gulf War, and then uh, eventually after the second, I mean, after the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and, uh, you know, like official formation of uh, Kurdish regional government, for instance, you see there that, that, you know, mainstream nationalist, I mean, Kurdish nationalist movement, they never raised, you know, like this flag of independence. Even, you know, like in 2017, uh, when we had this referendum, well, uh, for independence in, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, for instance, it was just uh, supposed to be used as a lever against, you know, like in, in, in negotiations with the central with the central government. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, Kurdish nationalist movement does not have a claim about, you know, like uh, does not have a political claim. A demand at the moment, an immediate demand for for any independent, uh, I would say, for any independent state. And as a matter of fact, you know, like I mean, I think historically, for uh, for I mean, for a long time from now, I mean, in the in near future, I don't think we would be able to have an independent Kurdish state at the I mean, like on, on, under these conditions. So, so I think uh, Ojalan's, you know, like this. Conf you know, like confederationalism is, is kind of a, a response, as a matter of fact, within uh, nationalist outlook to this political deadlock, so to say. Okay. But, but that, you know, like that, the I mean declaring independence would cause, you know, like it would provocate Turkey or Iraqi central government or whatever. Well, even when you have a confederation or a federation as well, you see that Turkey, for instance, at, at the moment, 
is trying to attack, you know, like the Syria and Kurdistan or wages war against Kurds in Turkey as well. So that's 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 that cannot be considered an alibi. But okay, we just wanted to say at the beginning. Um, well, of course, it's it's a good thing, as a matter of fact, to have some sort of a, a, a you know, like I would say, a state model or a society model, you know, like a model of governance that is based on or that is rooted, let's say, in some sort of Western or modern, you know, like Canton, you know, uh, administration like in Switzerland or like in many other federal countries, so to say. But that's, that's by itself is a good thing. It's much better than having something like an Islamic state or, you know, like a model of governance like what we have in, in, in Iran. But the, the problem is that, you know, like uh, this uh, confederative model that Ojalan is, is, you know, like uh, is, is suggesting leaves m many of the, uh, you know, like, uh, fundamental questions untouched. First of all, it does not touch upon the question of secularism, for instance, okay? To the contrary, it's something like, it's a model that is based upon uh, recognizing minor, not only minorities, but recognizing you know, like different identities, like religions, uh, sects, so on and so forth. So, uh, and then come up with this idea, so like kind of postmodernist idea of a uh, a mosaic, a society as a mosaic. So it, it, it does not, you know, like, I mean, uh, refer to anything like uh, a universal, I would say, concept of citizenship. I mean, which, you know, like guarantees certain rights to its, uh, to, the, to the citizens, regardless of their ethnicity, religion, sex, gender, so on and so forth, so to say, okay. And, and, and this by itself is very problematic. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, like when, uh, when you consider this situation in, you know, like in, in Syria in practice, you know, like beside the theoretical things in, in practice, you know, uh, when, when you declare a federation, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, like by declaring a federation, you're in a sense confirming the legitimacy and then existence of, the, of, the, of, of some sort of central government, like the Syrian government, okay, like the Assad regime. For, for the time being. I mean, because, you know, like uh, contrary to, to independence, which is, uh, which resembles a little bit divorce, then it's like a, a, a one-sided decision. You know, you can, you can decide by yourself to get divorce, okay? Although you have to go undergo certain processes. But when you're talking about federation or confederation, you're talking something like marriage, you know? Like, so it means that, you know, there, there are different parties that are involved. So, so, in this, in, in this sense, you know, like when you go on the real ground, it means that, you know, like the, the Kurds and, and I mean, not Kurds, of course, I mean, like the uh, YPG or, you know, like the, the party of uh, the People's Unity Party in, in, in Syria and Kurdistan, it means that they're ready, as a matter of fact, to negotiate with, uh, with the Syrian government or any other government that, that is there not, uh, I mean, it can be with Assad or without Assad. I know, like, a meaning that they would, from the beginning, by, I mean, like, a, a, by principle, would subject themselves, as a matter of fact, to certain, you know, like, uh, dictates that are coming from the central, central government. And that's, that's the most problematic aspect, as a matter of fact, of, of this um, confederative model in practice, at least to the extent that, uh, that Iraq, uh, Syria and Kurdistan is at stake. So if you if you go on this uh, the metaphor of marriage, you're sort of suggesting that the confederacy requires someone to be the judge or the the priest who is legitimating the marriage between these different parties, not different only, cantons. Yeah, not only that, but you know, like you cannot just say, okay, I I, I want you to marry you. You you have to be my spouse. You know, like then you like that. That's what I'm trying to say. So. You cannot just declare all of a sudden, you know, out of the blue, let's say to the, to the Syrian government, okay, we are now from now on a federation, you know, because me, at least it, it, it requires, you know, their confirmation as well. And perhaps you're going to negotiate certain, you know, like conditions about this, you know, like from, I don't know, foreign affairs to designing military, so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say, as a matter of fact, is that uh, as the left wing 
of Kurdish nationalist movement, what is what is happening in, in reality, I think, it's just, you know, like, it is the repetition of the same scenario that nationalist, uh, I mean, Kurdish nationalist movement have been after. It's not really about uh, independence, it's not even really about, you know, like, bettering conditions, necessarily bettering conditions of people, but it is about, you know, sharing the power with the central government. So when, when you look at it from this, uh, from this angle, there is not a real difference as a matter of like essential difference between the politics of, 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 of let's say, um, the People's Unity Party in, in, uh, or PKKs, you know, like politics in, in Turkish Kurdistan or in Syrian Kurdistan, and what, let's say, um, the nationalist, mainstream nationalist parties like the, the Democratic Party of Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, is, is, is pursuing, I mean, in, in terms of politics, in terms of, you know, like gaining uh, political power. So the, so the strategy is this, you know, like based upon, uh, I would say, based upon uh, the conflicts of regional forces, uh, trying to get, you know, like uh, on, on one side of this conflict and we like make maneuvers on the cracks and then try to get a share of power. And that's it. So it is in this sense that it, it, we, we see this red scenario is being repeated also by, uh, unfortunately, in Syria and Kurdistan. Well, uh, to push you a little bit on that, I mean, I know it's a bit difficult to get accurate information from war zones in Syria and Kurdistan. But if we compare Iraqi Kurdistan and Syria and Kurdistan, there does seem to be, first of all, in Iraqi Kurdistan, there, there is a relatively traditionally structured central government of the region, that is the regional government of, of the autonomous region of Kurdistan, that in a lot of ways functions like a traditional state, even without declaring independence, and is very much connected into the international capitalist economy through its oil deals. and. At least there's a, a claim on the side of the uh, in the areas where the the YPD or PYD in Syrian Kurdistan is is leading that they would have a different model not only of this political governance but also a different economic model focused on cooperatives and uh, well they don't they don't have the same level of oil wealth so they can't they don't have as much to sell internationally so again you might say this is partly making a virtue of necessity, but maybe there is still something, uh, or at least some potential, even if we're not sure exactly how far it will get, of, of establishing different kinds of economic relations on the ground in, in these areas. Uh, well, how, do you see, how do you see that? Uh, well, you know, like discussing the, 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 cooper you know, the cooperative model by itself, it's, it's, it's a totally like, it requires a lot of time. I'm not going to touch upon that, but just just to say that you know, like, uh, I I don't believe that and just a, a cooperative model can can be an alternative model for capitalist economy, like because you you leave a lot of things untouched. Okay, first of all, uh, again, if you, if you look at the program, you know, like uh, what is going on, let's say in, in Syria and Kurdistan, again, you know, like uh, you don't see an in reality, an alternative economic model working. Like, I mean, uh, part of, you know, like what is happening is that, you know, because we are in some sort of, you know, like a, a state of emergency or state of war at the, at the, at the moment, you know, like uh, what I'm trying to say is that maybe we can relate I mean, the impossibility of implementing any, any model, whatever, any, any economic model. Uh, in, in part or in large part is based on the, on the situation that there is war. But beside that, I mean, there is not, I mean, we are not being offered any, any alternative model, economic model. Really. Like just this is, you know, like some sort of this uh, romanticized, you know, like uh, cooperative system based upon, you know, supposedly based upon older Kurdish, you know, like traditions that according to Ojalan goes back to two, three, 4,000 years ago, I don't know, you know, like that's what he says. So it's some sort of a revival of that kind of model. But you see like in, in reality, like uh, money economy still is at work. Okay, 
uh, and, 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 you know, like, there's another thing, again, as I said, the very political fact that, you know, like, they, they, they suggest this confederation. I mean, how would it be possible to be, like, for, 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 for a region to be part of, let's say, any country? It doesn't have to be just Syria and Iraq, I mean, and, and Syria and Kurdistan. It can be, you know, like a canton in Switzerland. How can you have, you know, like a, a, a canton that is run by a different economic model, but still is part of, you know, like this federation of, of Switzerland? It's by itself an impossibility. And as a matter of fact, that's, that's even if you want to, you know, like implement a different model, economic model, that you, that you claim it is superior to, you know, like, some, let's say, both capitalism and the, the Marxist alternative or socialist alternatives. Well, you have to have your own state in a sense. So, so the, the necessary uh, condition for implementing such a different economic politics re- is, is independence. But as I said, there's no such a claim. That's the, that's the problem. So when there's no such a claim, I mean, when there's a necessary condition, it's not there. How can there be any real alternative you know, implemented there? It's well, maybe the, the best, I'm sorry, the best analogy would be like talking about war communism during the um, civil war after the 1917 Bolshevik revolution. Well, yeah, war communism, they called it, for instance. But, you know, like even Lenin himself would, would admit that war communism is not communism in the proper sense of the term, for instance. I'm still interested, though, in this, uh, in in the way that by not immediately declaring independence, there may be some other opportunities that, or at least it, it, it changes this the scenario of if we focus on the national versus international question. Uh, we could it, briefly getting back to what you said about this the state and economic questions. We could still say that yeah, maybe. Confederalism is, in any case, regardless of what is expressed, it might give way to the eventual emergence of some kind of de facto state if the Syrian state breaks down or the Iraqi state eventually breaks apart. But if that state is no longer a nation state, because if that's if that claim is is pushed back, as we see at least in in Ocalan's writings of what the PKK and its affiliated groups should should focus on. I wonder if that it changes a bit the way we look at the the prospects for left internationalism in these areas. Insofar as we see it, what happens historically often is a leftist movement for national independence, if it's successful often then gives way to right-wing movements to defend this nation-state against its supposed enemies. But if the nation-state doesn't form, maybe that particular trend would uh, move in different directions. I don't know if, if, you, if you see what I'm saying about whether, whether this opens up new possibilities or if you see it simply as de facto recognition of kind of multicultural neoliberalism, which may be better than national chauvinism that we see in other places, but if you don't see it as particularly innovative? Well, you know, like, the, the thing is, we have to really look at the real situation right now. I mean, like, uh, that we, we can talk about this, so so to say, uh, you know, like, confederation, so to say, I don't know, confederation in, 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 in Syria and Kurdistan, okay. It's... Uh, it is based on the existing situation in, 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 in Syria and in the region. So, so that's, that's the problem, you know, like it, 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 it doesn't come, you know, like, I mean, it does not have any claim, you know, beyond that, you know. So, so I would say that, first of all, the limit of its existence somehow is, you know, like, like, like uh, it's, it's, you know, like the perpetuation, I mean, the perpetuation of this situation based upon the continuation of the existing political, you know, like turmoil or, uh, you know, like the political and, and, and uh, yeah, political conflict in Syria. Once, in one way or another, it is resolved. I think. Well, this this one will be also resolved as well. I mean, I think it would be ended. You know, like somehow, it it has to. You know, like even even if we have a confederation of Syria, that's that's what I'm trying to say. Even if we have a confederation of Syria, let's say in the future, okay. 
well, it, it would be somehow, uh, you know, like a result of an agreement between all these regional powers, right? So it would, it would not leave the situation like the vacuum that, that there is right now in, 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 in Syria and Kurdistan, first of all. I mean, I'm not against using the opportunity. Definitely the revolutionaries, leftists, whoever, you know, they have to, they have to, you know, like use the opportunity. And as a matter of fact, you know, like the, those revolutionaries in, in Syria and Kurdistan, they used this opportunity, okay? Let's say if there were Marxists there as well, they had to, I mean, they had the, they had the duty to, to, to use this opportunity. But what comes after? Now, what, what kind of a program you are suggesting, mean, like they're, 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 you know, like, uh, um, proposing. That's, that's the problem. That's, that's what I'm talking about. You know, you could have come up, you know, like with a certain, you know, like a, a, a new notion of citizenship that would not be based upon uh, ethnicity, religion, so on and so forth, because you see, you know, as a matter of fact, what is going on at, uh, in, in, in the region, in, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in particular in Iraq and Syria, see, you know, like it's, it's all about, you know, like these supposedly at least the, the, the abuse as I say or deployment or utilization of these identities as a matter of fact in order to you know like uh, kind of uh, deepen the war you know like and uh, the, the, this regional powers and international powers using all these different groups as a matter of fact in order to pursue their own uh, interest in the region so on and so forth so how could you know like uh, how could as a matter of fact a system or, you know, like a political, uh, a political, uh, I would say, power that defines itself just like that, be immune to this. And that's why you see, you know, like it, even when you look at, you know, like the politics of, of, of this Syria and Kurdistan, you know, what, what's going on, to some extent, at, at some point, you know, back in 2011, 2012, they had quite very good, you know, relations with, 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 with Erdogan and with Turkey. Because at that time, for, for you know, like uh, Erdogan, the problem was, you know, like where uh, the agenda was to, to remove, you know, like uh, to remove Assad, you know, from power. And then, you know, like perhaps, you know, like kind of realize this neo-Ottoman dreams, so to say. And in that fight, you know, like uh, maybe uh, the Kurds could be good, good, you know, like a, a good ally, reliable ally. But the moment, you know, like the politics of Erdogan changed, as a matter of fact, because of different reasons in Turkey, because he had to, for instance, you know, like somehow consolidate his power based upon, you know, like all these chauvinistic and nationalistic, you know, like uh, politics and you know, slogans, so on and so forth. When it, when it changed, it, again, you know, like the situation, I mean, like they, their relation to, to, uh, to, to Syrian Kurds also changed. And they started to attack them. This time, you know, the Syrian Kurds, they had to somehow, you know, like either they, they were pushed to, you know, like go and make a deal with, with Assad, but then because the US intervened, now they, they made a deal with US. And you remember during the time of Trump, what happened. You know, like, and so easily, like after some international deals with between Russia, US, you know, Assad regime and Turkey, you saw that, you know, like the, the Turkish military forces, they invaded Afrin and, you know, like, uh, Sarekani and other, you know, like cities that, that belong in some, some of the Kurdish cantons, for instance. So that, that's, that's a thing I'm trying to say, you know, there is no real, in, there is no real solution. And this, in, in reality, I think this uh, confederation model itself is, you know, like a model of inaction, in a sense. It is the, the, the expression of, of lack of this horizon or lack of, of, lack of this real uh, political demand which is like, as, as I mentioned, it's common to all uh, Kurdish nationalist like, like factions from left to right. That, that's the problem, uh, I think. If uh, No, we only have a couple minutes, but I, I actually wanted to go back to what you were saying a couple minutes ago, which uh, was about the vision that you think this revolutionary opportunity opened up possibilities for c establishing and, and putting out new visions, which maybe haven't been fully, uh, we can argue about to what extent the visions that actually emerged are adequate. But, but I wanted to turn then from looking at the Kurdish movements and what would be best for Kurdistan to looking at 
the broader left, especially in, in these four countries, um, and es especially in Turkey, where, where I know you, I uh, mean, you, you had to leave the university for showing support in spite of the criticisms that you, that you have for these groups, um, or at least for opposing repression against them. Um, and we've seen that the, the Kurdish movement has given birth to the HDP as a party that has gone beyond specific Kurdish issues and is a major player in, Kurdish, in, in Turkish politics. Uh, so I wonder, you know, on the one hand, uh, this is what, what does the Kurdish movement mean for the left in the region, for, th for the left's prospects? Uh, is there some tension between advocating for Kurdish causes and advocating for international or nationwide but multi-ethnic causes? And, and you still see, like, at least maybe there's been some push that this, this change of situation has opened a lot of questions, even if maybe the answers aren't always uh, clear. Um, I know that, that was a big question, but if you yeah. can, in a couple of minutes, talk about the broader left in the region. And just one thing, of course, you know, like there is a very, very positive thing about, you know, like what happened in, in Syria and Kurdistan, first of all, it showed something that people, if united and organized, they can really defend themselves and they can, you know, like I mean, push their own agenda. That's a very good thing, of course. And I think it's a big contribution, as a matter of fact, to, 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 to the, you know, like libertarian movement in the whole region, right? That this is for sure. And it would contribute definitely to sharpening up. In, in the long run, the sharpening of class conflict as well in, 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 the, in the region. But uh, the thing is this, as, as far as, you know, like HDP is, is, is concerned, you know, like, uh, well, definitely national problem or, you know, like the, the discrimination against Kurds, it's, it's, it's an issue that should be addressed, okay? Although HDP is not, you know, like, um, it, it does not limit itself nowadays with that. And as you mentioned, it's a major political force in, uh, in, in in Turkey. I think the reason is that, you know, like uh, the reason is, again, it's, it's because, uh, well, traditionally the left anywhere, you know, like in Turkey, in Kurdistan, so on and so forth, uh, uh, really like deals in me, like they try to resolve this uh, discrimination against Kurds for sure. Okay. And then the thing is that how, but how HTP gained power it's not just only by, you know, like emphasizing, you know, like the, the, the Kurdish problem, but, you know, like the, the, the more to the extent that HDP, you know, like proposed a more radical left program, so to say, okay, it gained momentum in the in, in whole Turkey. And it, it, it shows something as a matter of fact, it shows a lack of a radical program in or the absence of la radical program in Turkey, as a matter of fact, that, that, that the reason that I think HDP gains power, not that it is not radical, not that it is not a, you know, like a, a reformist, radical reformist, you know, party, but it is something like Syriza, you know, like in, in Greece. So it, 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 it's, it's a showcase of something as a, something larger, I think, in society. The society, as a matter of fact, demands, you know, like it needs as, uh, this kind of radical, very, very radical program. And any party to the extent that you know, like getting a little bit closer to that to that radical demands, you know, it, it gains power and it becomes you know like more, more popular. And I think that's what what happened with with HTP. You know, the moment that HTP you know raised all these you know like demands, not only about Kurds, not only about you know like uh, recognition of rights and cultural rights of Kurdish people and political rights of Kurdish people, but to the extent that it raised the banner you know like demands of women, for instance of youth, of workers, and so on and so forth, it became a more popular power. Uh, so I think it, it, the, the situation points towards that, at least. I, I hope I could cover at least some of the, some part of the question that you asked. Well, thank you very much. There's, there's always a lot more that we could cover, but I, I guess our time is just about up. So um, we will leave it there. Thanks once again to Siavesh Azeri, and once again, I'm Joe Grimm-Feinberg. And uh, thank you all for tuning in to our discussion of free Kurdistan, national liberation, and internationalism, and the prospects for not only the region in 
Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey, but hopefully these are questions that concern us throughout the world. So thank you once again. Thank you.